Do you feel? Do you ever feel? I wish I hadn't said that. Je ne regret rien. No regrets I at all. I regret nothing. Manishankar Iyer, the introduction to your memoirs very interestingly talks about how Sonia Gandhi encouraged you to write them because, as you say, she probably had no place or no productive role for you in the party. So before any more, any further, so before we get to the rest of the book, is that still the case? What is your relationship with the Congress Party today? None, none at all. In 2015, when she made that remark, it was in the realm of speculation that she had no plans for me. Mm -hmm. But the rejig of the Congress Working Committee, uh, which took place a day or two ago, clearly shows that the party has no use for me. Mm -hmm. And they'd have no use for me because they regard me as a loose cannon. Well, they've now cut the last chain on the loose cannon. Aren't you a loose cannon? I don't think so. I'm a man of principle. It depends on how you look at it. I believe very strongly in democracy through Panchayati Raj, particularly in secularism, on which I'm a fundamentalist, on, in socialism, which the Congress party has now abandoned, and non-alignment, which again, as far as I can see, the Congress party has abandoned. Well, I joined the Nehruvian Indravian Congress. Mm. I joined the Rajiv Congress. And the party has been drifting from its ideological moorings. And I think the pragmatists in the party regard me as dangerous because I keep trying to pull the party back to first principles. And that is why I've had to pay not a price, a very heavy price of being as excluded from my roots in the Congress, as perhaps you were from the NDTV. The book opens with um, a reception, as you mentioned, in the lawns of your home in 2015, when you first start talking about uh, these memoirs, or Chiki Sarkar starts talking to you about these memoirs, and as you said, Mrs. Gandhi encourages you to write them. That was 2015. We are now in 2023. Have you been meeting with the Gandhi family, with the Congress leadership at all, or is it completely a broken relationship? No, yesterday, uh, no, sorry, about two weeks ago, I did have a very relaxed, pleasant one-on-one -on -one meeting with Sonia Gandhi after a gap literally of 10 years. So I began the discussion by telling her that it was 10 years since I had stepped into her room. I've had on two occasions in these last 10 years, opportunities of meeting separately with uh, Rahul Gandhi and with Priyanka Gandhi. But getting to meet them takes a decade. Mm. And then one knows that for another decade, uh, one won't be meeting them to have a conversation. Of course, I see them at Congress functions. Of course, I was six or seven times, I think eight times in the Bharat Jodo Yatra, mm. but uh, not to hold a conversation. and not to be involved or even if nobody asked me and what I write, I don't think they read with the result that I'm just cut off completely from the party. But I joined the party because I believed in its ideology and I'm not going to leave the party. They may sack me, but I'm not leaving the party. I'm going to remain within the fold and uh, continue doing what I can, which is writing. My speaking has got decreased a great deal because now television channels do not call me. And uh, I try to ignore bites which are sought by people like A and I. And therefore I'm not in the public eye, but uh, I continue to have the ability to think and write. 
And so I'll continue doing that. You said that you would not leave the party and they could throw you out if they so wish. They did suspend you at one point and it was for comments that you made uh, about the Prime Minister where you were talking, you used the word Meech and it was immediately conflated with the Prime Minister's caste. When you look back at that comment uh, or a previous comment that got you into the headlines for the wrong reason where you referenced the Prime Minister's childhood being the son of a tea vendor, do you feel, do you ever feel, I wish I hadn't said that? Je ne regret rien. No regrets I at all. I regret nothing. And it's because I think I have been very un unfairly pillory. Mm. It started with you, in fact. What did I do? You, you pilloried me on the 17th of January, 19, uh, sorry, 2017, uh, mm. when uh, I was alleged to have called Mr. Modi a chaiwala, when in fact it was he who called himself a chaiwala. And I was mocking is calling himself a Chaiwala. But at that time, because I was just about to catch a flight, I didn't, I didn't have the ammunition to answer you in 2017. But in this book, I have effectively answered you personally. But in addition to you personally, your colleague Rajdeep Sardesai has been selling his book by saying that Modi should write five thank you notes. And then he always raises a laugh when he says the last note should be to Manisha Karaya. I think it's rubbish to suggest that I have so much influence that I alone can make Modi the Prime Minister or undo him. No, obviously you can't. So obviously. Then what is the point of your coming back to that now? Let me, and let me come to the Nietzsche comment. Mm -hmm. I said he's a low kind of person in English. That is to say, the English translation of Meech Kisam Ka Admi is a low kind of person. And Mr. Modi twisted that during an election campaign that was on at that time in Gujarat to claim that I had called him a low caste person. And without giving me the least opportunity to explain what I had said, the Congress party in their desperation to win the Gujarat state election thought that they could win it by suspending me. And when they suspended me, they sent me a show cause notice. And I kept wanting to answer the show cause notice. But the three member disciplinary committee comprising Mr. A.K. Anthony, Mr. Sushil Shinde and Mr. Motilal Bora separately and jointly asked me not to answer the thing because they were going to check with Rahul Gandhi what I should write in my answer to the show cause notice. Mm. And at that time, I was completely on my own and had been given no opportunity to explain myself. But then in August, in fact, August 20th, which is Rajiv Gandhi's birthday, I was told that I would be taken back into the Congress. I was. My suspension was removed. But that was in 2018. Mm. And five years later, I have no responsibilities given to me whatsoever in the Congress. My constituency, which I fought seven times, has been handed over to the, B to the DMK. And I have never been asked to, or since then, I've never been asked to go on an election campaign. I have never been given any office in the Congress party. I'm not a member of parliament. So I'm as distanced as anyone can be from the party. But in my heart, I believe in the Nehruvian, Indira Gandhi, Rajiv Gandhi Congress. I don't believe in the Narasimha Rao Congress. And ever since Narasimha Rao's time, the Congress has been drifting from its moorings, whereas I remain a Congress fundamentalist. Okay, you've said a lot there and while not wanting to make the conversation about those comments, so we'll move on quickly from those. I just want to say that we can look at them as a larger debate around elitism. It's something you actually address in your book that, you know, you were tagged as being one of the Doon school boys around Rajiv Gandhi and you explained that actually you knew him quite little before you uh, entered politics. But when we look at these controversial comments that you made about the Prime Minister, 
people might look at them as an example of what beleaguered the Congress, a certain kind of social snobbery, a certain kind of social elitism. You can quibble with me over the words. Did I say chai wala? Did I not? But you did mock. You did mock the Prime Minister for his roots. I mocked him for calling himself a chai wala, which is not the same thing. I didn't mock the Prime Minister. I mocked his calling himself a chai wala, but he played it and people believed him and he played up his being an OBC, people believed him. He has been the Prime Minister for nine years, whatever Manishankar Ayer may have said. Isn't it time he moved away from what happened then to what is happening now? Hmm. So what is happening now is symbolized by what's happening in Manipur. He should be addressing that, does he? He accuses us of Tushti Karan. Okay, let's talk about, you say you're a member of the Nehru Congress, the Rajiv Congress, not the Narasimha Rao Congress. So let's start with a very interesting analysis in your book about 1984. And you talk about four things you thought should have happened differently. I thought six, but okay. it doesn't matter. Le okay, maybe I'm remembering four, you can add the other two. And you see that one, Rajiv Gandhi should have apologized immediately. Two, he should have removed his cousin, who was then the police commissioner of Delhi, Gotham Call. Three, the army uh, should have been called in much earlier. And four, a judicial inquiry should have been announced much earlier, not a few months later, as was the case. Why do you think these things did not happen? And the other very interesting thing you write, just one more detail from your book. You talk about how later uh, a senior military officer tells you that the reason the army was not called earlier is that the army was in Meerut and it would have taken time to bring it. But you say that actually somebody had to explain to the people of India why it would take so long when in 1857 it, would it took less time for the army to move from Meerut. This is one of the references you make. So go major, ahead and talk about 84. What Major General Jamwal said, you just take your last point, yeah. is that the army unit in Delhi cantonment is always kept under stress in order to prevent a coup d'etat, a military coup d'etat. So he said that even if I had been asked to send in my units, I would have had to wait until I got reinforcements from uh, Merit. Now, I am not an army man and have had nothing to do with military matters. So I have just cited that Although it was told to me perhaps a decade after the events, at that time I didn't know. Also, I have to stress that I wasn't in PMO then mm. and had no idea that within a couple of months I would be in PMO. I was very concerned with that because I am married to a sick lady. And my worry on the 1st of November, that is the day of the worst massacres, was I thought the Sikhs would retaliate. They didn't. But at that time on the 1st, I thought they'd retaliate. So I didn't know whether my, how my family would be under threat from Hindus because of my Sikh wife mm. or whether I would be under threat from Sikhs because of me and my children. So that was um, a major personal concern. But at the same time, I was utterly horrified that so many people should be killed and the government should seem to be so impotent. It was much later that I learned that because, because Rajiv Gandhi had just become prime minister and had inherited from his mother her most senior minister who was destined to become the prime minister of India, as the Home Minister of that is India and S.L. Khurana, a very highly reputed ICS officer as the Lieutenant Governor of Delhi, he thought he could leave it to them to control the thing. But when he found they were not able to control it, he went personally in his car in the middle of the night to some of the worst affected areas and as a result, and he called in the army and as a result of his actions, the rioting came down and eventually ended. 
So, I think it it is uh, it, it, they was not behind any conspiracy. It has been hinted that Arun Nehru, who was the real political power mm. in the party on those two or three days, was the one who had encouraged uh, congressmen uh, to to you know voice their protest with this kind of massacre. But there has been no proof of this allegation. And I, and I mentioned it only because, you know, it has come up in the media. Yeah. I've seen the allegation, but I had no proof for it. You also think the apology came much too late? Oh, far too late. The apology was far too late. It was delayed by more than 10 years. And it took a Sikh Prime Minister of the Congress Party to give that apology. Mm. Also, there was a dismissal of that cousin, Gautam Kaul. But it was not because of the Sikh riots. It was because he had proved his incompetence again in 1986 on Gandhi Jayanti, when a Sikh terrorist had taken refuge on a tree uh, from which he could have shot dead both the Prime Minister and the President. But he didn't, he had a 12 bore gun. And because Rajiv knows, knew a great deal about ballistics, as soon as he heard the first shot, he knew that it was a 12 bore gun. And uh, he advised the president that, no, let's sit through this. And then you send your family home, but let us ensure that we complete what we have to do, which is going to Raj Ghat and, and to Shantiwan. And they did it. He's a man of immense courage, but he understood the risk he was taking. Mm. And had he dismissed that cousin for incompetence in the Sikh rioting, or not the Sikh rioting, the Sikh The anti-Sikh pogrom, yes. This was a pogrom. Then I think he would have got the credit for it. And if he denounced a judicial inquiry immediately, instead of, as you said, a few months later, I think it would have gone down well. But he did one thing for which he is rarely given credit. While he may not have spoken as he ought to, and I have underlined why he should have spoken, he did act. He went to Husseinimala, and I went with him on the 23rd of March. And that began the process of informing the Punjabis that India was with Punjab, and Punjab was a part and parcel of India that the Sikh community was not alien to us, it was one of us. And it led within a few months to the Lagoval Accord. And uh, yeah. I have quoted a journalist, I've forgotten what his name was, a Sikh gentleman, who came to me and said that Hosayi Wala is all hypocrisy. But it wasn't. We now know that the first thing he did after winning the elections and Arjun Singh had a big role to play in winning the elections for him in Madhya Pradesh. He removed him from being chief minister after 24 hours and sent him to Punjab. Nobody knew then why. But if you read Arjun Singh's book, it turned out that he was chosen, handpicked, mm. cherry picked, if you like, to be the principal interlocutor with the Sikhs. Mm. And then he handed over because he didn't have called an election, but he called it, knowing that the Akali Dal will win. Okay, you you uh, seem to suggest that the Rajiv Congress was the Rajiv Congress was closer to the ideological moorings of the Congress Party that you identify with, but there are two other sort of uh, blocks on that record. And one is what happens in the Shabano case, the case involving alimony to divorced Muslim women. And the second is the Shilanyas and unlocking Ayodhya. Now, I read your book. Well, two separate. I understand. Let's deal with each of them. Let's separately. deal with each of them separately. Let's pick up the Shabano case sure. first. And also I want to quote another book that I read alongside yours, which is Neerja Chaudhary's book which has a very interesting nugget. I don't know if you'll agree with it. She argues that Sonia Gandhi was not convinced of the direction in which Rajiv Gandhi was moving on Shahbano. This is, this is a... I've said that in my book. 
I understand. But she but I quoted not DP Tripathi. Yes. But Rajiv Gandhi. So let's talk. Rajiv about said to me at that time that even Sonia disagrees. I quoted that in my book. So can we start there? Can yes, we start with that story? Can I very quickly sum it up? Yes. There was immediately after the Muslim women's uh, protection of rights on divorce bill was passed in May 1986. In September, a very well-known nominal Muslim jurist filed a writ petition in the Supreme Court arguing that this was ultra virus of the Constitution, that it was illegal and immoral, and that uh, case went before the Supreme Court in September 1986. Now, unfortunately, the law's delays are the law's delays. Mm. But the Supreme Court in 2001 gave its, its judgment on the Daniel Latifi petition. Mm. And they said, far from reversing the Shabano judgment, it was never reversed. Far from reversing the Shabano judgment, the solution found through the judicial genius uh, of uh, jurisprudential genius of Ashok Sen and the political good sense of Rajiv Gandhi was to codify Muslim law in respect of divorce and to, by codifying it, to make eventually, that's how I'll explain why eventually, the Muslim waqf boards responsible for the girl if the male members of her family fail to do so or if she fails to get remarried and in 78 percent of the cases i've cited a survey muslim women get remarried divorced muslim women get remarried within two years so it's not as for many hindu widows a lifelong problem not for all but for many it's not anyhow the state work board was made responsible under our civil law Right. And they said that if the state work board doesn't look after him, the board will be called before the magistrate and it will the, they'll be forced to do, to do so by judicial order. And that judgment has lasted for more than 20 years. And for more than 20 years, all Muslim women's divorce cases have been handled under that law. So how can it be said that he was being communal when he listened to what Muslims had to say, listened also to what some Muslim dissidents like Arif Muhammad Khan had to say, listened as Madhu Dandavate said in the Lok Sabha, that he listened to the opposition, he called in various people, not as Vajarat Habibullah suggests, one person namely uh, M.G. Akbar and he thought about it and when he came to the conclusion that it was his duty as the Prime Minister of India to ensure that our minority community felt wanted and respected mm -hmm. and that this question of Muslim women being divorced and then left on their own his first question that he asked was why did the Sessions Court award the lady, Shabana, 25 rupees a month? Mm -hmm. And then the Jabal Court, Jabalpur High Court raises it to the munificent sum of 179 rupees and 20 paise in case 179 rupees is not enough. Yeah. And the Supreme Court, which waxes eloquent, does nothing about increasing that. He ensured and then he said to me, after it was all over, he said that my opponents tell me that, I'm not quoting his exact words because I'm speaking from memory. He said, my opponents say that no, no, no woman, Muslim or non-Muslim, is now going to vote for me. And he says that no man, especially people of liberal outlook, and no uh, non-Muslim man is also going to vote for me. The only people who will vote for me because of this are, Muslim, are a handful of Muslim clerics. 
So what, whom am I appeasing? He asked me that question. Rhetorically. Yeah. He didn't expect an answer. So why did, what part did his wife not agree with? I don't know. You have to ask her. But it was all clear. All Rajiv said clear. to me, yeah. all that Rajiv said to me is, this was in the same connection as the other remark that he made. He said that even Sonia does not agree with me. But he did it. And he was so fond of his wife, so respectful of his wife, that if he did it, there is a principle involved. And unfortunately, that incident marked the alliance between the left, the liberals, and the Hindu extremists. And it brought down Rajiv's government. But Rajiv's principle was endorsed by the highest court in the land and has ultimately prevailed for the last 20 years and yet nobody talks about this. Basically, you're arguing that he looked for a solution within the personal law. Yes. And, and why, should, why not? The personal law as it's given in the Sharia, and they all agreed to this, because he was consulting with the Muslim theologians, mm. apart from others. They all explained to him that the Muslim personal law on divorce is not some barbarous Arab desert practice of the seventh century. It, a Muslim girl gets married through a nikah nama, which is a contract, and that nikah nama only stipulates what is to happen in case the marriage fails. That is why it's not understood by so many Indians. Because in, among Hindus, divorce is a very rare practice and often leads to great immunization of the divorced Hindu woman. But this is not the case in Muslim personal law as okay. distinct from Muslim personal practice. Okay. And it was because the, the interpretation and, and enforcement of Muslim personal law was in the hands of Malvis and Mullahs. Therefore, Rajiv took it out of their hands and put it into the civil law practice of India. Let's, 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 let's move on to Ayodhya. Let's move on to Ayodhya. Yeah, sure. There too, it's been suggested, and you mentioned Arun Nehru in the context of uh, what happened in 1984 with the Sikhs. It has also been suggested that, oh, maybe it was Arun Nehru who really drove this idea of, you know, unlocking, unlocking the this. The Shilaniyas is one thing. The unlocking is another. Okay. If so, if you are going to talk about it, don't talk about the Shilaniyas. Talk about the Babri Masjid question. The question, the the question that I would ask you, is a larger question. Yeah. You have argued that Rajiv's Congress was closer to the ideological moorings of the party than the Narasimha Rao Congress. But Rajiv Gandhi is also accused of trying to find this crazy balance between the Hindu vote and the Muslim vote. And the reason I asked you about Ayodhya and Shah Banu in the same question is that one was seen as an example of one and the other was seen as an example of the other. So let's talk about where you want to I start. I just explained. I have understood the Shah Banu. Yes. So let's so please move. don't bring it up. Okay. And when you're talking about Ayodhya, please distinguish between the opening of the locks, which took place in February of 1986, and the Shilanyas, which took place in 1989. November. Okay. And let us consider these issues calmly okay. and without passion. In uh, You began by asking me about the Shilanyas. So let's start with okay. the Shilanyas. By 1989, especially after the terrible loss in Tamil Nadu, which he had visited 13 times at the instance of Mr. G.K. Mupadar, who was supposed to be the great expert, and we won only 26 seats in the assembly. And I didn't tell Rajiv that many of them were of the constituencies he had not visited. So Mupanar's advice on Tamil Nadu was disastrous, but it also led to Jagannath Mishra's removal from the chief ministership of Bihar by the Bihar Congress party. So the party was in a panic. And Rajiv therefore brought in, brought back R.K. Dhawan, mm. who had been firmly excluded for the first four years. 
And as soon as R.K. Dhawan came in, you got this balancing act being advised. So I have been extremely critical in my book about the Shilanyas. Yes. So I think you have to acknowledge this, I, I was, that I have, yes. I have said that Rajiv Gandhi was panicked into abandoning the principles of a lifetime by listening to this argument about the Sharanyas. Now, what was the argument about the Sharanyas that people like Dhawan were putting forward? It is that if you allow, if you ensure that the Babri Masjid continues to stand, the Muslims will be delighted. And if you do the Shilanyas outside the disputed area, then the Hindus will be delighted. What happened, I've said in my book, is that seeing the masjid standing, the Hindu, for, the, for those Hindus, for him, this was an issue, they said that we are voting for you. And the Muslims seeing the Shilanyas taking place, said that our vote is not for you. So instead of winning both sides, he lost both sides. And that was really a tragedy. And it was the instant reason why he went down yeah. from over 400 seats to under 200. And he therefore realized that he had been, he had taken, he didn't want to shift the responsibility, that he had taken and endorsed wrong advice, which is why the whole of 1990 which turned out to be his last full year of life. He devoted to first doing an introspection with everybody concerned, then convening the Convention Against Communalism, which I have described at great length, and what Narasimha Rao and Gadgil did to me and Akbar, and the questions that they asked, and how I answered them, and how they then dismissed the paper, saying these may be your views, they're not ours, they're not the Congress parties. And then Rajiv undertaking the Sadhbhavna Yatras, which took us all over the country, where the, where the slogans were all a total reaffirmation of fundamental secularism. Mm. Now, all this needs to be seen in perspective. Mm. Was it a sin that he committed in 1989? I thought so in 1989. But looking at what he did in 1990, I would call it a huge political mistake. And I don't buy the argument that he was trying deliberately as a matter of policy or as a matter of his fundamental policy to balance Hindus against Muslims. He believed in equal rights to religion for the majority as for the minorities. Okay, you uh, remain of course an admirer of Rajiv Gandhi. Is no, that a that's not word? because I'm blind. It's because I have seen him in action. I've seen him as a good man, an upright man, an honest man, a man of principle, who was betrayed by some key aides. But why are we talking about all this? All this forms the bulk of my next book. We were here to talk about my current book. This is all is about the, myself. By the way, yeah, but what about myself? I'm coming to it. I'm, well, you're coming. This is now. Hang on, hang, hang, hang on. All of the things I have cited are from your book. By the yes, way, yes, they are. They are all. I've also said there that you people like you yes. should wait for the next book. Okay. I've said it. In I wanted to actually share a story. But you have to sell your program. So no. Program. Hang on. Forget who has to sell what. I was going to come to a very very, I would say, acerbic story from your book about Sanjay Gandhi, when you, 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 you stopped me midway. I said, you're obviously somebody who identifies with Rajiv Gandhi, what's and all. But there's a, there's a very sort of, there's a little paragraph in the book when you are informed that Sanjay Gandhi's plane has crashed. And you write in the book, you, I'm paraphrasing, you write in the book, you said, I don't know if there's a God, but if there is a God, thank you, God, for saving us from this catastrophe. I found it, people aren't usually that candid in a, in a book. You were being only partly funny, right? Well, that's exactly what happened. And I think it would be very wrong of me 
to not mention it. I have mentioned it. I have also mentioned my desperately opposing the emergency of Mrs. Gandhi's and at that time everyone associated with that emergency. Yeah. I thought the emergency was not an aberration but the first assault on our constitutional rights. So I was very much against the emergency although at that time I was a government servant and I made my views clear to all my colleagues. I even made it clear when I came back to India mm. that I was dead opposed to what was happening. And I described at that time the greatest joy in life was to lie on the lawns in the November sun mm. of Patiala House when I came back on home leave and listen to the proceedings of the Shah Commission mm. which were being broadcast from loudspeakers. So I was dead against the emergency. And Sanjay Gandhi had a life that was effectively confined to the emergency. Yeah. He was the face of the worst things about the emergency. So I could have discreetly hidden this idea, <laughs> but it wouldn't have been Manisha Karaya. This is true. Now let's talk about a very moving portion in the book, which is how your family comes as refugees from Pakistan to India. And there's a very, very vivid, disturbing account of um, a child who is killed, I think, in front of your father. He wasn't killed. But uh, uh, shot, attacked, rather. No, no, they were going uh, to Am attack. I getting the story wrong? Okay. You because can see, but was just marginally wrong. Okay. I'd like to tell the right story. Please. I was six years old when partition took place. Yes. My f mother and her children were in Shimla, which was given to India. My father was at the end of a 20-year stay in Lahore and had, in fact, according to my mother, intended to become a Pakistani because his practice was largely in the areas of India that became West Pakistan. So we were living in Shimla because my father was a very prominent, very reputed income tax uh, expert mm. and he primarily practiced in the appellate court mm. and the appellate tribunal of the income tax would move to Shimla in the summer. So Amma would keep house for him in Shimla and he'd visit us from time to time from the hall. That's how on the 14th of August my father was in Pakistan and on the 15th of August, we were in India and we were living in a building called Three Bridges mm. on what used to be called by the British as Jacko Hill, mm. but is now called, I think, Jaku Hill. Yes. So we were living there and at about, it must have been before 8 p.m. because I was always put to bed very strictly mm. by 8 p.m. So it must have been about 7 o'clock that a group of Sikhs, a kind of jatha of Sikhs, banged very heavily on the door. My mother opened the door and they said, where are the Muslims? And she replied, they've gone to Pakistan. But the boy of my age who belonged to that family and lived on the ground floor was my best friend. So I was about to say, no, no, they haven't gone to Pakistan, they're here when something in my mother's eye prevented me from opening my mouth. Yeah. And the Jatha were very disappointed to be uh, absorbed of their, to be uh, deprived of their victims. And they broke the kitchen, which in those days used to be built outside the main house. And then they went away. But next day, there was a body a, a slashed body discovered on the Jacko Hill. Yeah. So maybe they found some victim. But the boy himself and his family, which ranged from a baby in arms to an over 80 year old woman, they were all saved. But only because my mother signaled me with her eye that I shouldn't speak. Now you may remember the scene from Ice Candy Man, Bapusi hmm. Sidwas, yes. Our novel, where an almost exactly the same thing happens. Yes. But in that case, the child says that the maid is in the house yeah. and she gets caught and yeah. terrible things happen to yeah. her. 
So when I read the Ice Candy Man, I felt that you know, people will think I'm inventing this story. Mm. So I just have to say that you have to trust me, it actually happened. And later, many years later, when you're actually a minister in government, uh, you talk about how Parvez Musharraf, General Musharraf, wanted his birth certificate to be pulled out from the records of uh, a Delhi municipal corporation. And you asked, maybe half cheekily for the same from Lahore. And you went fully cheekily. Fully cheekily. And was surprised uh, by the speed at which you were then able to procure those papers. I made my remark yeah. at about six o'clock in the evening. All of us, the whole delegation, we were 55 of us, were taken to the Lahore municipality. Mm -hmm. And that meeting took place at about six in the evening. That's when I asked for my birth certificate. And at nine o'clock the following morning, literally overnight, when I came down, I found the birth certificate duly attested, mm. lying inside a brown envelope, and everybody waiting for me to open it. And they all applauded, and of course I joined in the yeah. applause. Yeah. Now, your belief on India-Pakistan relations has remained a much debated one. You have spoken about, you know, your belief in a kind of peace that some might call today a utopian idea, especially look at what the turmoil within Pakistan today. Do you think, given your experience in Pakistan as a foreign service officer, uh, your, your being on track to initiatives, do you think today, looking at the churn in Pakistan, that you have too romantic a view of it? Look at the Soviet Union. The churn in the Soviet Union yeah. was much more serious than whatever is happening in Pakistan now. And yet, we retained a policy of friendship with that country, whether it was called the Soviet Union or it became the Federation, the Russian Federation. And has remained at the same level whether Brezhnev is in power or Putin is in power. So there are some elements of foreign policy that deal with permanent interests. Mm -hmm. They don't deal with individuals. We have never had a stable relationship with Pakistan. And my experience of Pakistan has been that there is an immense fund of goodwill among the Pakistani people for us. Mm -hmm. So I have two pleas to make, which I've made in the book. Number one, we must leverage the goodwill among the Pakistani people for our relationship with that country's people, even if not with the state. So with the people, we mustn't punish them for acts of state. And we're doing that by denying them visas. Mm. Their relatives in huge numbers live in India. And I lived among them, I worked among them for three years. I issued more than three lakh visas in three years. I brought in 10 Pakistani journalists to the window from which we handed out the passports. After I had succeeded in reaching a lakh visas within six months of opening the visa office. And when these journalists handed over the 990, what do you call it, 9.9 .9 lakh, 9.9 uh, thousand uh, visas, the last 10 visas, the 10th, the last person got it, I gave him a tin of, a tin of uh, Darjeeling tea mm. and I mafied the uh, visa fee and suddenly all the others waiting, they went into slogans. Hindustan ke consul general, Zindabad, Zindabad. Mm. They were saying, you know, here koi pabandi nahi, koi rishwat nahi. Right. Now, if that is the kind of reaction, and I've given several instances of this in my book, from the people of Pakistan, when we are nice to them, why do we take it out on them when we want to quarrel with the state? Mm. And as far as the state is concerned, if we have the courage to go into surgical strikes against them, why do we have the courage to sit across a table from them, to sit across a table and conduct a dialogue with them does not amount to conceding everything that they want. 
but it does mean engagement. And I was perhaps my happiest moment in this year has not been the uh, welcome that is apparently being accorded to my book, according to my publisher. But when five former High Commissioners of India to Pakistan sat on a panel at the re release, posthumous release of Sati Lamba's book. book, all five of them who have been through some of the worst times in India-Pakistan relations insisted that we must engage with the Pakistani state. To engage with them is not to lose out. And if we engage with them persistently, which I have used the expression uninterrupted you know, dialogue. notorious, yes. uninterrupted and uninterruptible, we've seen under Manmohan Singh that we can even talk Kashmir and arrive at a four-point agreement. Okay. So therefore, I am not being starry-eyed as I am portrayed as being when I plead for a good relationship or a viable relationship between India and Pakistan. I am being utterly realistic and I insist on this point that India cannot become a Vishwaguru so long as it doesn't have a happy, harmonious relationship in its own neighborhood primarily with Pakistan. Okay, we will have a separate conversation on India-Pakistan because we could talk for hours about that and debate that for hours. I want to end with where your life starts, the school and college years that we haven't actually spoken about. Uh, one of the interesting things that you say in your book is that you say that there's a media stereotype about Rajiv Gandhi and his Dune school boys. And you make the argument that actually you didn't start working with Rajiv because of an old connection or because you knew him well before. And that you found this a bit of a caricature. So today when, you know, a lot is said about the elite years, uh, again, I come back to the social elitism of doom school, Stephanian elitism that defined the politics of that time. Do you want to talk about, about how you don't fully agree with that I don't agree with characterization? I, yes. I, I, it is true that many of us came yeah. from well-off families. Yes. But then what do you do with an IAS and an IFS that is constituted by people from well-off families? I mean, who in the civil service is not from a well-off family. So we were there, but we weren't feathering our nests or trying to promote the class interest. 99% of our time was taken in dealing with the problems of the disempowered. And my main work with Rajiv Gandhi was on the Panchayat Raj bill. Now what is elitist about the Panchayat Raj amendments? We have and I want to stress this because you didn't bring it up and I need to bring it up. Okay. Under the Panchayat Raj amendments of the elitist Rajiv Gandhi, we today have 14 to 15 lakh elected women. We have more elected women in India alone than in the rest of the world put together. And yet, this is not the subject of celebration. I am amazed. It's so elitist to ignore these women and so elitist to not understand that when panchayat elections take place, unless they are prevented by amendments such as those made in Rajasthan and Haryana, it is the poor, the Dalit, the tribal women who get elected much more than the local zamindar because the local Zamindar's wife would tend to spend her time in town, not in the village, and approaching her is a problem. But people know that if they vote for a Dalit poor woman, then she has nowhere to go but stay in the village. And then they can easily go to her door and say, my drain is not leaving, uh, allowing water to go, or my tap is not working. So we have conducted a profound <coughs> socio-economic change in India through that Panchayati Raj bill. And who prepared it? It was all Rajiv's idea, a doom school boy. And it was all written up by Manisha Karaya, a doom school boy. 
not my fault that my parents sent me to school, but it is, I think, to the credit of my mother that instead of taking us out of school, when my father died, I was only 12 years old, uh, the, she said, education is the biggest asset. Yeah. And when she died, there was 300 rupees in her account. And because we didn't inherit any property, my brother and my sister and I are perfectly happy. If instead my mother had put the insurance money into a two-story building in Malcha Mark, we'd have ended up calling who's going to inherit that house. So I'm deeply grateful that my mother was, in, was penurious and very, very grateful to her that she thought education is the only asset worth having. So we were concerned in the technology missions. With what? With things that would assist the poorest and the loneliest and the lowest. For example, the oil seeds mission, mm. which is never talked about. Did you, you know, I'm sure, that edible oil is one of the biggest items on our import bill. Under the technology mission of Rajiv Gandhi, oil seeds production in India doubled over 10 years. Double. It went from 9 to 18 million tons. And oil seeds are grown where? Where you can't grow other crops. Who are the farmers in these uh, rain-starved areas? It is the poorest. Now he went to Kalahandi and he made a very sensible decision there. That the reason they were having so many famines is simply because they were cultivating rice in a rain shadow area. And rice is a very thirsty crop. So he said, let's ensure under the area development program that rice is provided at a subsidized price so that they can grow ragi, mm. which is of course possible in a rain shadow area. So the only thing we ever did was for the poor. And that is why Rajiv insisted on calling himself a socialist despite all the efforts of Dr. Montek Singh Adhavadiya to get him to start the reform process. He started the reform process, but the emphasis was always on the poor. So why are we called elite? It's not our fault that our children, that our parents were rich, and that we took advantage of our education, not to buzz off to the United States or to Singapore, but to remain in this country and to serve this country. Finally, you call your years at St. Stephen's College, yeah. lyrical, uh, which of course makes me smile because it's also my college. However, there is a certain Stephanian tendency to be so obsessed with clever word play that you can come, up, come off sounding as arrogant. So let me, funny but arrogant. So let me give you two examples from your own life. One is the famous Natwar Singh Mani Shankar Ayer story, where Natwar Singh goes back to college and Natwar Singh... I hope you get the story right. Okay, why don't you tell the story? All right. I, had, I was invited by my old college to address their informal Wednesday after dinner meeting. And when I got there, I was taken into the principal's room. Now, when we were in St. Stephen's, I don't know about your time, you were only called into the principal's room to be rusticated. Mm -hmm. So I was overcome with a certain nervousness from the past. And so when they presented me with the visitor's book, I was a bit bewildered as to what I should write. So I, to get inspiration, I started going through the previous pages. And I saw an entry by Natwa. It said, K. Natwa Singh, Minister of State for External Affairs. And in the, in the comments column, he wrote, I am what I am because of St. Stephen's. So I asked for a pencil <laughs> and I wrote under it, Why blame the college? <laughs> well, it's a typical Stephen's yes. story. Yes. The other story I wanted to tell you. Can I ask the other yeah, story? Sure. Ajay Markhan. 
Now, I, I know, you're not going to immediately know why I'm asking you this. You are sports minister. You've been put in the sports ministry. You don't want to be in the sports ministry. Mr. Markan writes a letter calling you obstructionist and saying that Manishankar is being obstructionist. The Commonwealth Games are going to be held or are to be held or whatever. And you turn around and you say, he can't possibly know the word obstructionist. He went to Hansrat College. Did you really read this, the book? Yes. Because then you Okay, that's why I want you to tell us. Let me tell you what this story was. Yes, I had opposed the Commonwealth Games and yes, I had requested not only in private but also in public the Prime Minister to relieve me of the responsibility of looking after yes. Mr. Kalmadi. Yes. After having told Mr. Kalmadi at our first official meeting that if he did not submit his uh, utilization certificate for some large sums of money being released to him, I said, I had no desire, Suresh, to spend time with you in Tihar jail. Hmm. And he did go to Tihar That's jail. right. So I was dead opposed to that. So I privately, in cabinet, in smaller meetings, when I met the prime minister, and at public events, like my giving the Sportsman of the Year award to Vishwanath Anand, I said to his parents who had come to collect it, I said to the best sportsman in India, from the worst sports minister that India has had, I was pleading to be removed. Yes. And fortunately, my pleas were attended to, and MS Gill was put in my place. Thereafter, in the next government, uh, Mr. Ajay Markan became their sports minister. And we had a very good relationship. He was, in fact, due to come to uh, my constituency where there is a SIS, Sports Authority of India, playground and I needed to get some things done there. So I arranged with him that he would come. So please know that my relationship at a personal level with Ajay Markan was extremely okay. cordial. In fact, when he stood in his first election and I was in charge of, or I was one of those in charge of the Delhi elections, it was I who opened his election office. So there's a great deal more to my relationship with Ajay Markan than the quip I Okay. I, I was only talking about the Sifian style quip. quip, quip yes. What he did was, he, I spoke in a TV interview with uh, somebody from, I think, India Today, who, and I, I if referring to Arun Puri having asked the Prime Minister why my object, had I raised objections on financial grounds and the Prime Minister replied no, he had ideological objections. I was asked by this girl who had obtained a secret letter I had written to the Prime Minister objecting on financial grounds to what was happening in the games. So she was displaying that letter to me and she said, how could the Prime Minister say that there were no differences on financial matters? And it was on ideological grounds that this difference was. I was confronted with my own writing. Mm. And I said that, I, I confessed that I did have financial objections as well, which I had conveyed to the Prime Minister. This of course caused a rumpus in PMO. And Ajay Markan, my friend Ajay Markan, was asked to write me a letter in which my answers in parliament mm. were cited in order to show that I was being hypocritical. Now, when you speak in parliament, you defend your government. Right. And he said that this shows that Manishankaraya's approach was dichotomous. Oh, dichotomous, right. A big word to use. So I said in an interview to a TV channel, I should never talk to your breed. <laughs> but I, I said to them that I want to talk, talk to you about the alternative sports policy I was attempting to evolve. But please don't ask me about the Manmohan controversy. And then at the end, he insisted on asking me about it. So then you're on a jam, the camera is on, Correct. you can't say no. 
and you people take advantage of that. Mm. Very illegitimate <laughs> advantage. But you often do. That's your game. Mm. That's your sort of game. It's just a job. Yes. But anyway, yeah. And you're always trying to trip people up. Not at instead all. Instead of getting them to say what they want. So I cracked a joke. I said that he's used a big word like dichotomous. I don't know how a BA honors, a BA past student from Hansraj College knows such big words. Yeah. And that caused a rumpus. It caused a rumpus and then my college principal, that's the St. Stephen's principal, went personally to Hansraj College to apologize. There's a team from Hansraj College who came and met me and said, sir, we are all appearing for the IAS exam. What will happen if we say that we are from Hansraj College? I said, if anybody comes to you and prevents you from getting a job on these jobs, please let me know. I'll clarify. But of course, you people are not interested. But, in but that my either. question was a little bit different, and let's end Your with that. Your question was Does this prove you elitist? No, I was going to say that there is a certain Stephanian sub subculture. Yeah, that's right. yeah. I was talking about that a college subculture that today in a changing India may come across as elitist and some of it is funny but nevertheless it can be dubbed snobbish. It is, yes. And I'll give you an, another yes, example yes. of exactly that. Suvash Dula, mm. who was from Sanaa, he said to me, why do you fellows walk around this place mm. as if you own it? So my reply to him was, we don't. So why don't you? Mm. And that was, I think, a very Doon School remark to me. Yeah. We laughed. The jokes cracked against me. Yeah. Arif Kamran described me as Manishan Karaya. This is in college. He's always willing to sacrifice truth at the altar of an aphorism. <laughs> it was my friend Shekhar Das Gupta, I've quoted him, yes. who, when I was ultimately allowed to come into the foreign service after being damned as a communist, he then said that they let you in because they discovered you were a Marxist but of the Groucho kind. <laughs> so it is very much a part of the ethos of St. Stephen that we speak English. If you go to a, a college where they generally speak Hindi, they'll be cracking jokes at each other in Hindi, yeah. which maybe you and I would find difficult to understand because cracking jokes in languages requires a very deep knowledge of the language. It's a play on words. It's a play on quotations. So therefore, I don't think we will be we are being snobbish. Yes, we are Makoleki Olad. But then what is the Indian civilizational heritage? It is synthesis. Whatever comes from outside, we synthesize. Mahatma Gandhi said, I do not want the windows of my house to be closed and my doors to be stuffed. I want the winds from all countries to blow out of my house, but I refuse to be blown off by any one of them. That is the true Stephanian and may I say so, Dosco creed. Okay, let's, since you're so clever with words, what's the one word Mani Shankar Iyer would use to describe himself? Oh, I've used it in the title. Maverick. That I have to agree with. Thank you, Mani Shankar Iyer. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. It's great to see you here. Thank you for watching our work. If you haven't subscribed yet, don't forget to click the bell icon and subscribe to Mojo Story and support independent, robust journalism.